So I was talking to Tom from the Urban Cycling Channel Shifter the other day, and he started asking me if I play basketball because there's a scoring system that could be used for bike rides, and I said, Tom, what the hell are you talking about? Well, let's let him explain it. Both of us would go for a ride in our respective cities, a similar ride. We decided to take an errand out to the hardware store. We'd record the rides, and then we'd compare them and play plus one, minus two, Urban Cycling Edition. Whenever there was a moment of bike friendliness, it made it easy to ride, we'd get a point. Whenever something made it difficult or discouraged us from riding, we'd take away two. All right, so today we're playing plus one, minus two, Urban Cycling. I've never played this game before, so I apologize if I get it wrong, but I think I understand what I'm doing. I'll be playing against Tom today, so we'll choose two players. I saw this video one time from NBA great Ray Allen. Okay, I'm gonna skip the cutscene. Let's just get to the game. First, we start out just outside Amsterdam Central Station on a two-way separated bicycle path. This is good quality cycling infrastructure. Pretty quickly, we come across a Kanto micro car in the bike path. Now, I know some people hate these, but I'm generally okay with them because they're usually used by disabled people or people with limited mobility. This is a good thing, but I hate that this one is not electric. I'm not going to give or remove points every time we run into a micro car on this trip, by the way. The bicycle path is wide enough for people to ride side by side and socialize. That's great. This is the first junction we come across and it has priority for cycling. We now turn onto this 30 km per hour street, so no cycling infrastructure is required. Most of the car traffic has been removed from this street, making it primarily for bicycles, so there's lots of room for cycling. Unfortunately here, delivery vehicles are blocking the street. So even though this street has most vehicle traffic removed, the traffic that does remain is still problematic for cycling. Thankfully, this cycling route will be redesigned in the near future so that bicycle through traffic will no longer need to go down this street. I talked about that in one of my Patreon bonus videos about Harlem or Houghtownen. Again, this street has priority, so this driver needs to yield. And this driver is waiting behind this cyclist for a safe time to pass. Most drivers in Amsterdam also cycle themselves, so they know what it's like to have an impatient driver behind them, and they're considerate to people cycling. The sidewalk here can be too narrow sometimes for the amount of foot traffic, requiring pedestrians to walk in the street. Another microcar. I've already talked about these, so I won't change the points. And here, the street only allows bicycles to go through. This is called a modal filter, and this is what limits car traffic on the street, making it pleasant to cycle on. And this is a nice intersection that's protected from motor vehicles. The bridge is up here, so we need to wait for a ship to cross. This is annoying, but also kind of fun to watch. Here we have our first moped in the bicycle path. In this part of the city, he should be riding on the street, not the bicycle path. The bridge is clear. We had to wait about two minutes in total. The cycling path is very busy now. This is due to the crowd that had to wait for the bridge, but it still feels quite claustrophobic. This is a good, safe place to wait for the light to change because this is a protected intersection. Bicycles need to yield to cars here. It wasn't a problem this time because traffic was light, but it's not ideal. By comparison, this junction here has priority for cycling. At this point, we enter a park with a wide two-way cycling track totally separated from traffic. You'll find cycling paths through parks in many cities, but this isn't just a recreational path. It is well connected and actually takes you to where you want to go. This is by design. In the Netherlands, the routes taken by cars and the routes taken by bicycles are purposefully made different, so there is as little interaction as possible. I've talked about this before in my Invisible Infrastructure video. 
The path here can be crowded at times, and it's shared with pedestrians, but because the path is so wide, it's not a problem at all. We're now far enough away from traffic that you can hear the birds instead of the cars. This is nice. There are construction vehicles here, but there's still room for bicycles to go both ways. Another micro car. These could be annoying on narrow bicycle paths, but on a path like this, it's really not a problem at all. And I'm glad that transportation alternatives like this are available to disabled or elderly people in the Netherlands. After almost 10 minutes of cycling, this is our first interaction with motor vehicles and it's a priority intersection for cyclists. And this highway crossing underpass is easy and comfortable. This now becomes a dedicated two-way path for cycling, but unfortunately now mopeds are allowed in this bicycle path, which is why you see these speed bumps. At least this moped is electric. Here we cross a tram line and go under several heavy rail lines, but it's so safe it doesn't really affect our ride. Construction of this building is blocking the bicycle path, but a safe and comfortable alternative is given. This is the first traffic light we've encountered in over 10 minutes, which is really great. Amsterdam goes to a lot of effort to ensure that cyclists encounter traffic lights as little as possible. There's more construction here, but it's not blocking the bicycle path. At this point, we turn off this road and onto another two-way cycling path. Okay, this is not great. There's a junction here that has priority for cars, plus these vans are partially parked in the bicycle path. But more importantly, this whole junction is weird. I cross and then turn left and cross the same street again, both times with priority for cars. I have no idea why I can't just cross once here. Does anybody know why it was designed this way? But it's amazing that bicycle paths can be used by people in mobility scooters, another way that the Netherlands provides mobility for disabled people without forcing them to use cars. But anyway, we're back on a two-way cycling path albeit with some construction and really annoying bumps every few meters. Mm. Mopeds are permitted in this cycling path, unfortunately. Mm. Mopeds annoy me, but out in the suburbs, they do provide people with a low-cost way of getting around. I hope they're replaced with e-bikes in the future, though. We're getting quite far into suburbia now, as you can tell by the tractor. It's also starting to rain. This intersection provides a safe separation between the relatively high-speed road and the cycling path. You hardly notice that you're crossing under a rail line here. The safe infrastructure continues as we turn at this light. The roads here have multiple lanes and higher speeds, but cycling remains very safe. We're cycling parallel to the road here, but it's so far away that you hardly notice the motor vehicle traffic. It's important to note here that this is not a strode. This road has no businesses along it. It is designed for the safe and efficient flow of traffic. The businesses are here on this side street, which does not interfere with traffic on the road.
It's nice for cycling to be so safe that you can hold hands and have a conversation while cycling. Racing cyclists can use these paths for leisure trips as well. Here's our exit for the commercial area. It's priority for cars, but I'm not going to fault them here because this is quite a remote location. Despite this being a relatively high speed road, this crossing is very safe because of the traffic calming and the island in the middle where cyclists can wait halfway if necessary. Now we come to this roundabout. I want to stop here and look at this. This roundabout is managing a lot of motor vehicle traffic, including heavy goods vehicles, but it remains perfectly safe for cycling and cyclists even have priority at crossings. It's incredible that even in a very industrial and suburban area like this, traffic flows efficiently and walking and cycling is perfectly safe. Here's what it's like to cross this busy roundabout on a bicycle. No problems at all. Now we enter the business park and separated bicycle paths are no longer required due to the slow speeds. Ooh, a chicken truck. That's a plus one. Here you can see several businesses that are along a side street, not along a strode, with limited parking out front as well as a parking garage around the corner. Much better than the sea of parking off a strode that's found in North America. Our destination is up ahead. And now we turn into the hardware store. As you might expect, there's a fairly large parking lot as people may be buying large volumes of hardware and lumber. But there's still easy access to a ride by cycling and a bicycle rack very close to the front door. Now I can lock my bike and head into the store to buy what I need. North Americans love to make excuses to avoid building cycling infrastructure. Many people would scoff at making it easy to cycle to the hardware store, assuming that everyone buys a truckload of lumber for every trip. But this is what I bought the last time I went to the hardware store near my house. Do you really need to drive two tons of steel just to buy this? And I wasn't the only person shopping by bicycle here today. And what about all the people who work here? Around the back of the store is the employee parking. And as you can see, many of them arrived by moped and bicycle. Street design like this is how you reduce traffic and how you avoid car dependency. Okay, so now let's do a comparable route in Calgary with Shifter. Like my ride in Amsterdam, this ride is from the city center to a hardware store that's about the same distance away. I'll give this a point for a protected bicycle lane. When he came here, I wasn't quite sure what you're supposed to do in this intersection. I'm not sure if this justifies docking points, but it could use some road markings. I think this is good. There's a protected lane under the bridge. This is nice for two reasons. Cyclists are protected from cars, of course, but also the cycle track doesn't need to go as far down as the road does because cyclists don't need much vertical clearance. In general, tunnels are preferable for cyclists over bridges because you can get speed on the way down, which helps you on the way up. Oh, now we're dumped onto the street. That's no good. Here's a decent two-way cycling path. However, two-way cycling paths are not a good idea when there are a lot of cross streets, and there are definitely too many here. But I'll talk about when and when not to use two-way cycling paths in a future video. Here's a pothole. I'm not going to dock points every time there's a pothole or this trip will be really far in the red. But these can be dangerous to people cycling, especially when they're filled with water, like this one. Here they have a bicycle detector that lets you know your bike was detected. Nice. Okay, so I'm not going to do this every time, but I'm giving a general minus two for no protection in any of these intersections. Protected intersections are pretty rare outside of the Netherlands, but it's still worth mentioning. A sign in the bike lane. Whoa, Calgary has beer bikes? 
I figure that's a milestone reached as a cycling city. But they're also really obnoxious. Here's a bike box for turning left. It's not protected, but this is pretty good for North America. Here we come to a parking protected bicycle path with a curb to prevent drivers from parking in the cycle path. Not up to Dutch standards, but when it comes to North American bicycle infrastructure, this is considered to be pretty good. Unfortunately, now we're in a painted bicycle gutter. Ugh, I hate loud motorcycles like this. They really make the city so unpleasant for anybody outside of a vehicle. We're back in a protected bicycle path again. Though it's quite narrow. And it becomes a painted bicycle gutter every time there's a side street or driveway. Watch the shopping cart! Hey, this is the best bicycle infrastructure of the ride. I wish I could give it more than one point. Unfortunately, this is a multi-use path that has people walking in it, but it's really not wide enough to avoid conflict between cyclists and pedestrians. Watch that fire hydrant. I guess this is a temporary bike lane? It's separated from cars anyway. Now we're back on the road again. This could be okay if it had traffic calming and slow speeds, but it has a 40 km per hour speed limit, a wide road design, and nothing to limit car traffic. A share the road sign, because you need a sign to tell drivers not to be dicks to people cycling. Here are some sharrows. Studies have found these to be worse than no infrastructure, because they give novice cyclists a false sense of security. This road has a 40 km per hour speed limit, but it's designed like a highway. Very few drivers will actually drive 40 on a road like this. Yeah, I'd go on the sidewalk here too. This is a typical Strode and it is a terrible, dangerous street design. As we get out into the suburbs, bicycle infrastructure becomes almost non-existent, even though the roads are very wide and there's more than enough space for it. This is typical of North American cities that see cycling as an activity exclusive to downtown neighborhoods. With this much space, it's really inexcusable that there's no infrastructure for cycling and such a small sidewalk too. If you want to stop people from riding bicycles on the sidewalk, give them a safe alternative. This side street is super wide. This is absolutely ridiculous for a supposed 40 km per hour speed limit. This residential street is also too wide, but I'm finished docking points for this. Stop signs suck, and this intersection is absolutely huge. This is terrible road design. Four lanes for cars here, yet absolutely nothing for cycling. Hey, is that a protected bicycle lane? Oh wait, it's actually a makeshift sidewalk. Here's a random ramp to the bus stop. This was all probably put in to meet accessibility requirements. This street doesn't even have real sidewalks, so I guess it's too much to expect real bicycle infrastructure, but it actually works pretty well as a protected bicycle lane here. Beep. 
This strode is ridiculous, but it's so typical of North American street design. This is not only dangerous, it doesn't even effectively move cars because of all the driveways, traffic lights, and side streets. Ugh, the road is recently paved, but the sidewalk looks like this. And here's a giant pole in the middle of an already small sidewalk. The only safe route here is through a parking lot. Now we come across this pedestrian bridge. Projects like this are billed as pedestrian infrastructure, but nobody actually wants to climb a bridge to cross the strode. The real reason bridges like this are built is so that cars don't need to slow down for pedestrians, and because the strode is too dangerous to cross on foot. And once we cross this giant parking lot, we arrive at the hardware store. but the bicycle rack is blocked by a forklift. Of course it is. And there isn't even a chicken truck. Well, that was a terrifying experience, but one that is all too familiar to anybody who cycles in the US and Canada. So when somebody claims the only reason so many people cycle in Amsterdam is because it's flat or because of the weather, I tell them to go f themselves. The real reason that less than 2% of the population cycles in the US and Canada is because it's too dangerous. It all comes down to infrastructure. But that's just my take. Tom also reviewed both rides on his channel, and I haven't seen the video yet, so I'm really interested to see how his scores compare to mine. So make sure you check out his video. So those are the two rides. A similar distance and a similar destination, but two very different experiences. What did you think of my scoring? Would you score them differently? Let me know in the comments. I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon, who pay me to make the other guy take the terrifying ride. If you'd like to support the channel and get access to bonus videos, visit patreon.com slash notjustbikes.